Welcome to this lecture on organic photovoltaics, which is part of the Clean for Yield video lecture series. My name is Mikkel Jørgensen, and I'm a senior scientist at the uh, Department of Energy Conversion and Storage at the uh, Technical University of Denmark. I'm part of the Sol Group at uh, Energy Conversion, and we're about 35 scientists, students, and technicians, and we're headed by Professor Frederick Krebs. Our main research area is organic solar cell research, from chemistry uh, to roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing. And we're situated here at a small campus outside Copenhagen, where we occupy two buildings and we have a large outdoor facility for studying uh, how organic solar cells can, uh, can be used in energy production. <coughs> And here's an outline of what I'm going to talk to you about today. First, I'll tell you a little about uh, the basic principles or uh, the rationale behind uh, photovoltaics in general. And then I'll uh, switch to organic photovoltaics, what uh, that is and, and what our motivation for working in this field is. Then I'll tell you a little about uh, how these organic solar cells are made. Um, special techniques like spin coating or roll-to-roll uh, -roll coating. And finally, uh, I'll end up by showing you some large-scale examples of organic solar cells uh, that we have made. <clears throat> so first of all, why use uh, solar energy? Well, the energy flux from the sun uh, is 174 petawatts. 89 of those reach the surface while the uh, world energy consumption, at least in 2013, where I have uh, data, was 18.3 terawatts. So the um, 89 uh, petawatts divided by 18.3 terawatts is about a factor of 4,800. So there are enormous amount of solar energy compared to what we use. This can also be shown in another way here is a comparison between the different energy resources that we have available. The illustration shows um, some spheres uh, where the volume is um, corresponds to the amount uh, of energy available in each energy resources. And as you can see, uh, the solar energy is by far the largest one especially if you compare to some of the other uh, renewable energy sources, such as geothermal energy, hydro, biomass, etc. They only cover uh, a small part of the energy that we actually need, but solar power uh, has a much, much larger potential. So this is the uh, reason why we want to use solar energy. There are two main types of solar energy technologies. First one is solar heating, uh, where you, for instance, heat up, uh, use the solar irradiation to heat up a liquid. Uh, this can uh, be stored and later used for, say, heating up your house or uh, convert it into uh, electricity in a generator later. But what we are concerned with today is solar, solar uh, photovoltaics, the direct um, the uh, direct transformation uh, of solar energy into electric power. And the most well-known of these photovoltaic technologies is, of course, based on silicon. And the first practical cells were developed by Bell Laboratories in the United States in 1954. They had a modest efficiency and were uh, fairly expensive. And they were first used in um, things like the satellites, for instance, in 1958, the Vanguard uh, satellite that I show here. And um, they were eminently uh, suited to this purpose because it's a little difficult to um, put a large power plant into a satellite uh, while um, the solar cells are comparably uh, lightweight and can be used for this purpose. And then later it was found that you do not need um, as pure silicon for solar cells as for, say, electronic or 
uh, microelectronic circuits. So you could use the uh, surplus or scrap silicon uh, from that uh, industry and then the prices fell drastically to around 10 to uh, 20 dollars per watt uh, electrical energy produced. And this trend of uh, price reductions has continued until present day and now we are at uh, considerably less than one dollar per watt generated. There are mainly three different types of silicon photovoltaics. There are the monocrystalline solar cells, which has the highest efficiency of about 18 percent. Then there are the mono or the poly or multi-crystalline uh, solar cells, which has uh, somewhat less efficiency and they are used mainly, for instance, in the uh, appliances that we put on top of our uh, roofs uh, to generate electricity. Then the final uh, one is the amorphous uh, silicon solar cells, which are even less efficient, about 8%, and they are used in, in cheap products. The photovoltaic effect, the first demonstration of, of uh, creating electricity directly from uh, sunlight was discovered by Alexander Edmund Becquerel in 1839. And the story goes that uh, he was a young man at 19 uh, working in his father's laboratory. He was out of a, a very famous family of uh, physicists. He was working in the laboratory uh, with some silver chloride and he had put two electrodes on it. And when he shone light on it, he discovered that uh, it also produced electricity. So this was the first observation of the effect. There's also the photoelectric effect, which was discovered by Heinrich Hertz in 1887. And this is uh, uh, what happens when, when light uh, shines on a metal. You can sometimes expel electrons. That was his discovery. And Albert Einstein later got the Nobel Prize for a detailed explanation of this phenomenon. And um, in metals you have the electrons, they have to occupy certain discrete uh, energy levels. And um, in order to expel an electron out of a metal, you have to overcome a certain potential, uh, the work function. So if the photon has less energy than um, the uh, work function, then no electrons can escape the metal. But if they have a surplus uh, energy, the electrons can escape uh, with a certain kinetic energy. This has some um, ramifications. This has some explanations for the solar cells that we use. There the active materials are semiconductors. And here the electrons are also confined to certain energy bands. In a semiconductor, there is a forbidden energy gap between the highest uh, occupied valence band, it's called, and then the uh, conduction band that is empty. And what happens when you shine light on um, an active material in a solar cell is that if the energy of the incoming photons are high enough, as in the photoelectric effect, then an electron is promoted up into the conduction band. And when that happens, you have an electron in the conduction band and the corresponding hole or positive charge in the valence band. And now they are free to move inside the material. And what happens in a solar cell when the light um, enters it is it whole cascade of events. First we have the absorption event where an excited state is generated, so-called exciton. This then forms the electron hole pair or positive negative uh, charge pair that we saw in the earlier slide. This pair of charges can then wander around inside the material until uh, they separate from each other we have charge separation, as it is called, and then hopefully the, these charges will end up at external electrodes where they can be used uh, in a circuit. <clears throat> a 
Here I'm illustrated with a silicon solar cell um, where um, the solar cell is made out of a thick slab of material that is doped. That is, um, we have made uh, a path for the electrons to go to one side of the material and the holes to the other side, so the electric charges uh, ac accumulate at the uh, electrodes. Silicon uh, is what is called an indirect band gap material. And this means that you not only have to overcome the energy gap between the uh, valence band and the conduction band, there are also some other restrictions that makes it a little harder to uh, absorb the photons. And for this reason, you need to make silicon solar cells somewhat uh, thick in order to absorb all the sunlight available. The main uh, interesting parameter for solar cells is their efficiency, the photovoltaic efficiency or power conversion efficiency. And this is simply um, a ratio between the maximum power that you, maximum electrical power that you can get out of the solar cell divided uh, by the incoming power of the light that shines onto the solar cell. And the way that we measure this is that we put a uh, source measure unit into contact with the uh, solar cell and then we shine light on it and we use a standard lamp which emulates the sun and that is that it has a thousand watts per square meter and a spectrum that uh, is very similar to sunlight. Uh, we then record what is called uh, a diode characteristics, uh, an IV curve, and this is the red curve shown in this uh, diagram here. We um, put a certain voltage across the solar cell and then we measure the current at the same time. By stepping through a number of voltages, we then get a, a curve like the red one. For instance, we have a, a point here where the voltage is zero. There we get the maximum current, the short circuit current that we can get out of a solar cell. And also we have here a point where the uh, current is zero, um, but we have the maximum voltage, which is called the open source voltage of the solar cell. In these two points, the power output uh, of the solar cell is zero because the power is the current uh, multiplied by the voltage. But in between these two points, we have the maximum power point. So if we instead plot the power as a function of the voltage, we get the green curve here. Uh, which has a maximum somewhere in between these two points. And from this we can find the uh, maximum power output of the solar cell. And we can then divide um, by the lamp power that we have and get the power conversion efficiency. There's also another measure of the efficiency. Uh, this is called the incident photon to current efficiency or external quantum efficiency. And that is simply the ratio between the number of electrons produced divided by the number of photons in the light in a given uh, wavelength interval. So we plot this as the uh, incident photon to current efficiency um, over the wavelength. You can see here for this solar cell it has a distinct region. Uh, where it produces electricity between something like 400 nanometers and 650 nanometers. So if photons have less energy than the photons at 650 nanometers, they do not um, contribute and they cannot uh, promote electrons from the conduction, from the valence band to the conduction band. And if we are above a certain energy, uh, we do not absorb, or this material do not absorb uh, the photons, so again we have no uh, solar cell action. So only inside this uh, small region here in the spectrum, uh, the solar cell is active. There are some theoretical limits to the solar cell efficiency. 
which has been found for some time. And if we look at the solar spectrum that I've plotted here in, in blue, and then we can imagine that every photon in, in that uh, spectrum could be converted into electrons. So if we sum up, uh, integrate uh, all the photons in the spectrum, then we can calculate the theoretical current that we could get out of a material. This is the red curve that you see here. Every material has, as you saw, a certain region uh, where they can absorb energy, so uh, we can only get, uh, this is I've tried to illustrate in the uh, gray area in the graph here, so we can only uh, 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 theoretically reach a certain uh, current for uh, a given material. Yeah, but it actually gets worse because um, the photons with very high energy gets absorbed in the uh, material, of course, and promotes electrons, but these electrons have uh, a surplus energy and they will um, uh, heat up the material until we reach uh, the band gap. So the maximum voltage that we can get out of a solar cell depends on the um, band gap size of the material. And this corresponds to the longest wavelength that the solar cell can absorb at. So uh, there is a maximum voltage uh, which is smaller the larger the wavelength that the material absorbs out to. So if we multiply these two, the voltage, maximum voltage that we can get out and the maximum current or integrated current uh, divided by the um, power from the light that we put into it, we get the maximum power conversion uh, efficiency theoretical for any material, and this is called the shockley quizzer limit, after the two guys who discovered this or uh, found the formulas for this. And for silicon, for instance, it is about 32% uh, efficiency that we can maximally uh, get out of a silicon solar cell. In practice, this is, of course, somewhat smaller. We can increase the efficiency um, in different ways. One of the ways is to build what is called tandem solar cells. If we put two cells on top of each other and one cell, for instance, take out one part of the solar spectrum and the other cell takes out another part of the solar spectrum, we can add up uh, the voltages from the two subcells and then improve uh, the overall efficiency of the total uh, solar cell stack. But this, of course, uh, is more complicated to build two cells or more cells on top of each other. The best um, solar cell efficiencies are collected by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the United States and plotted in this diagram that I show here. And, uh, the blue curves here are for silicon and you can see they have improved over time and now uh, they have reached sort of a plateau uh, around 25 percent. These are the very best solar cells of that type. Um, the ones that you can buy for your house etc. Uh, have less efficiency than this. There are technologies that are even better. For instance solar cells made out of a material called gallium arsenide uh, can be significantly better and there are these tandem or even multi-junction solar cells that are much better, but also much more costly. Then there are some emerging uh, technologies, and one of these are organic solar cells, which I'm going to talk about in the, the rest of this lecture. This is a relatively newcomer to the field. Uh, it started in about year 2000. Uh, and the efficiencies have now climbed to around 10%, a modest 10%. So uh, it is much less efficient than the more established technologies, but the uh, efficiency is still rising for this technology. We have tried to uh, make some realistic assessments of organic solar cells and compare them to uh, the more established solar cell technologies, we did a meta-analysis of all uh, organic solar cell reports made until about 2012. And there were about 9,000 um, 
scientific papers in that study and uh, some 10,500 individual solar cells reported. I've shown these uh, as small red dots in these diagrams here and you can see that they are concentrated uh, at fairly low efficiency values below uh, 10 percent. Um, but all solar cell technologies sort of fall on a straight line if you plot the efficiency versus the uh, current that you get out of them. There's some universal trend for uh, all solar cell technologies that follow uh, this path here. There are some alternatives to silicon solar cells. Um, as I said, we have the organic solar cells. There are other thin film technologies like the cadmium telluride or um, copper indium gallium uh, selenide cell, six cells, dye sensitized solar cells, and a newcomer called perovskites, which are an inorganic type which contains lead or, or tin. And the reason for people uh, investigating these technologies are, of course, there are a number of drawbacks to silicon solar cells. When you make silicon solar cells, um, you have to uh, use high energy input, the chemical energy of uh, silicon dioxide, which is the raw material, is high. In order to split that uh, apart and, and get the silicon, you need high energies. You also need to uh, melt the silicon. Uh, and this uh, has a melting point about 1410 degrees and again this takes uh, a lot of energy. Finally, uh, they have to have a fairly high purity, not as high as in, in the electronics industry, but nevertheless they have to be of uh, a high purity. The technology is not very scalable. Um, they are single um, units that you have to assemble, for instance, when you make modules, uh, which is very labor-intensive. Silicon, as you saw, is an indirect band gap material, so it has a low absorption. So this means that you have to use fairly uh, large amount of thick solar cells for this. So there are many, plenty of reasons for investigating alternatives. And one of these that are, I think are uh, especially attractive are the organic solar cells. <clears throat> so why do we study organic solar cells? Well, they promise uh, several things. First of all, I think they promise a very low cost uh, because they are uh, printed um, like you would print uh, things on, on, on plastic, for instance. They can be made on very large areas. They are flexible in uh, comparison to, to silicon or other inorganic solar cells. They have a thin outline because it's a direct band gap material usually, so you need a, a thin slab of material. And they can be produced under ambient conditions. They don't need um, high temperatures or uh, a lot of heat. And the manufacture is very fast. Uh, you can do roll-to-roll -roll manufacture which is on the order of 10 to 100 meters per minute. And they don't use any scars or toxic uh, materials. So I think there are plenty of reasons uh, why we should investigate organic solar cells, although the efficiency uh, is fairly low compared to the other technologies. So what is an organic solar cell? Well, uh, as the name implies, it's a solar cell where the active material is based on organic compounds, mainly polymers, for instance. But it could also mean that uh, the substrate and what you put it into, the encapsulation, is made out of plastic. Some of the other layers uh, that are necessary in the solar cell could be inorganic. Um, and I've shown here a diagram of what it looks like. It's a layered stack of material. So you have the active material that um, absorbs the light and uh, creates the charge carriers in the middle. And then you have layers on each side, for instance, a hole transport layer and an electron transport layer uh, that makes the electrons and holes go to uh, each side of the solar cell and be collected at electrodes uh, on the top and the bottom, for instance. 
here are some of the active materials that are used for organic solar cells. Uh, we mainly use two components. One is a polymer, um, such as this P3HT, uh, and then we have an, what is called an acceptor molecule, which uh, has a high affinity for electrons. The um, polymer is conjugated, and that means that uh, there are alternating double and single bonds in the molecule, and, and that has several effects. One is that uh, it drastically increases the absorption uh, of the polymer, so it can absorb the light that we shine on the solar cell, but it also uh, makes it possible for electrons and holes to move along uh, such a chain. We mix these two components in an ink, and then we prepare a uh, layer, the active layer, uh, and the two components are then uh, form small domains inside the material where uh, these different processes, the absorption, the um, generation of charge carriers, and charge separation, etc., occurs, and the um, detailed structure, the morphology is called, uh, of this material has, um, is very important for how efficiently it works. There uh, are uh, many different types of polymers used. This is one of the very active areas of uh, research for organic solar cells. People come up with new polymers that absorb different regions of uh, the spectrum or uh, are more efficient at uh, conducting the charge carriers. The working principle of an organic solar cell I've tried to, to show here in an exploded view of the solar cell. So in the middle we have the active layer which are composed of these two components, the polymer which is shown in red and the acceptor which is in black, and um, they have sort of face separated into discrete uh, nanoscopic uh, domains inside the active layer so that there are paths for the different types of uh, charge carriers, so the holes can run in the polymer and the electrons can run in the acceptor. And then there are layers uh, on the top and bottom, we have a hole transporting layer and we have an electron transport layer, and then we have finally electrodes on the outside. And one of these electrodes, of course, has to be semi-transparent for the light to enter into the solar cell. So what happens first is that the light enters, it uh, gets absorbed inside the polymer, and we get a, um, a f uh, formation of a carrier pair, a positive and a negative uh, charge and then they will move around inside the polymer material until they reach a phase boundary between the acceptor and the polymer and they will then um, charge separate and the carriers will run to their respective electrodes where they can then be used in an external circuit. The charge separation part of this cascade of events um, is perhaps one of the most difficult parts. Um, the reason is that the exciton, the excited state that is generated inside the polymer material, uh, cannot live for a very uh, long time. So it cannot travel far uh, before it has to be charge separated. So the uh, structure, the internal structure, the morphology of the active layer needs to be such that there is a very short path until we reach a phase boundary between the polymer and the electron acceptor. The simplest uh, naive way would be to have a bilayer, um, but this is also the one where there is the largest distances inside the material before we reach a phase boundary, so this is not a very uh, efficient way of um, nanostructuring or structuring the material. The best or ideal case is portrayed here in the middle. If we could somehow engineer um, the internal structure, so the distance to travel for an exciton 
was on the order of 10 nanometers or so, and that would be the best case. But this is very difficult engineering-wise to do, so we simply rely instead on um, a self-assembling kind of uh, reaction, so when we mix uh, the ink and dry it out, it will phase separate uh, by itself into domains of an appropriate size. And much of the research goes into uh, actually improving uh, this phase separation into uh, discrete sizes. The solar cell can be built up in um, actually two uh, geometries. You can either extract the um, electrons at the bottom and the holes at the top or vice versa. So if the electrons are extracted at the bottom and the holes at the top of the solar cell, the geometry is called the normal geometry. And the reason for that is perhaps that this was the first one that was realized. The other way around is for the uh, holes to be extracted at the back electrode and the electrons at the top electrode. And this is called the inverted uh, structure. And this has some ramifications for which kind of materials that you can use as electrodes. In the first case, the normal geometry, um, you would use a back uh, electrode material like aluminum, which is actually very reactive. And while in the inverted structure, you can use a metal like silver which is not so reactive. So the normal geometry type cells are almost invariably less stable uh, than the inverted type. So when you design your solar cell, you also want the solar cells to be stable, uh, have a prolonged lifetime. So you have to uh, think about which kind of geometry also that you want to imply. I'll now show you a few examples of how you can make organic solar cells. There are two main um, technologies that people use. Uh, the most used is what is called spin coating, um, where you have uh, a glass substrate, for instance, and then you uh, rotate that fast while you drop a solution of your ink, uh, for instance, your active ink on top of this. And the rotating motion then uh, makes the ink surface go flat and thin in a very short time, so you get an even uh, thin slab of material. This is used in about 95% of all the research of, on organic solar cells, and the main emphasis on that type of uh, solar cells is to uh, create high-efficiency solar cells. It is not very true to the vision that I showed before of uh, large-scale production on flexible substrates uh, and very fast. This you can realize instead in roll-to-roll -roll production, uh, which we uh, uh, study a great deal here at DTU. Here you can have sizes that vary from, say, square centimeters to many square meters. You can have lengths of foil that are perhaps kilometers long. And the main emphasis of this kind of research is to realize organic solar cells as a product and perhaps also study things like stability issues. <clears throat> roll to roll production of organic solar cells uh, can be done on, on different types of machines, but in a fairly large scale, it's shown on um, a machine like this one here where you have a complicated setup where the foil uh, starts in one end of the machine at the unwinder station and then goes through uh, various stations uh, through the machine. For instance, we have uh, different printing or, or coating stations like the flexo printing station here. We have a slot die coating uh, station there and then we have ovens to dry out the ink while it rolls through the machine, we have a rotary uh, screen printing um, station there. And finally, the foil ends up on the rewinder uh, station over here. So we have many different uh, printing and 
coating technologies that we can apply in such a large scale machine. There are principally two uh, different uh, techniques that you can use. One is coating and the other is printing. Coating is one dimensional techniques and uh, slot die coating which produces stripes for instance, the knife coating where you can uh, cover areas of uh, foil with your material. Then there are many different printing technologies which are two-dimensional where you can make patterns of any design really. And this is perhaps mostly um, mostly kind to for instance newspaper printing or or printing on plastic bags etc. Um, we have flex flexo printing, we have gravure printing, screen and inkjet printing. We have applied all these techniques uh, in different large-scale uh, solar cells and I'll show a few uh, in the remaining part of the lecture here. One of them is called the free OPV, which is a uh, postcard-sized uh, solar cell that is built up of um, either 8 or 16 uh, cells in series. Um, they are made by these roll-to-roll uh, -roll techniques. Um, they are low-cost uh, solar cells. They also have uh, low efficiency. You can see one here that I have shown, about 2%. We have examples up to, say, 4% now. Um, they are free for several reasons, uh, and one of them is that we have omitted techniques uh, which incorporate scarce uh, elements. We have omitted indium tin oxide. We don't use uh, vacuum uh, technologies. So everything can be done uh, under ambient conditions. The processing uh, of these solar cells are very fast. Uh, some of the uh, printing or coating steps are as fast as uh, 20 meters per minute. Uh, and we can have a huge amount of solar cells, for instance, on a 100 meter stretch, we have about 2,000 of these uh, modules here. We also call them free OPV for another reason, because we felt that um, it would be uh, good for the community if, if uh, people could get to know and experience these solar cells. So they are made freely available if you have um, a scientific purpose or, or uh, educational purpose that you can uh, apply for, for solar cells at our homepage at www.plasticphotovoltaics.org. We have many different versions of the free OPV. This is the vehicle that we uh, use for uh, investigating this technology. So the first types were uh, ITO free and made use of the common um, polymer materials that are standard, P3HT for instance, but we have also made um, free OPV with many new types of uh, organic polymers that we synthesize at our laboratories. We have made solar cells on top of each other, these so-called tandem solar cells. And we have even made uh, some solar cells where we have replaced the silver electrodes with carbon. The most complicated um, solar cells that we have made this way is the tandem solar cells. And here we printed 14 uh, layers on top of each other. Um, so we have the different active layers and we have the different supporting layers like the uh, uh, electron transport layer, the whole transport layer and uh, different uh, combinations layers in the middle. And on the outside we have protecting layers that encapsulate uh, the solar cells. So a very complicated endeavor. Uh, to make these solar cells. And the way that we built up the, the experience to do this was starting uh, on a small scale. We had developed a mini roll coater, which is simply a rotating drum where the 
foil can be put on a meter length of foil and we can investigate the different types of uh, printing and coating technologies in a small scale. We also built a small roll-to-roll -roll instrument which can be put inside a x-ray machine and we can investigate what happens uh, in the ink as it dries and develops this very important um, uh, microstructure morphology. And we, when we were satisfied that we uh, mastered the techniques on a smaller scale, we then went on to the big machine that I showed you previously. <clears throat> Finally, uh, we have a very large scale project which is called Solar Park, where we investigate how um, organic solar cells can be used for uh, producing energy uh, to the grid. And here we have uh, an outside installation where we have four um, panels, four very long, large panels, 100 meters long and two and a half meters high that are anchored. Uh, so they are uh, at right angles to the, the sun at noon. And here we place uh, our solar cells uh, for this purpose. And these are 100 meter long modules um, and they contain uh, tens of thousands of cells in series. And this is done by this meandering uh, pattern of uh, solar cells that I've shown here. And it of course requires that you can print a 100 meter long stretch of organic solar cells defect free uh, so they are in, in total connection. And this is actually possible as I've shown here. Here's an example of an IV curve or diode characteristics uh, for such a huge module. It contains 20,864 individual small solar cells that are connected in series. Um, so it's 100 meter long. It has an area of 14.6 square meters and it generates 11.3 kilovolts, uh, but only a current corresponding to a single cell, about uh, 40 milliamps. And uh, this, I think, is a testament uh, to the ability of making uh, huge amounts of uh, organic solar cells virtually defect-free, um, that we can add up the voltages of many, many, many uh, solar cells in this fashion. Also, they are fairly stable. As you can see in this diagram, we have many uh, thousands of hours of um, them working outside in adverse conditions in the Danish climate. The deployment of these um, solar cells for the solar park is very fast, much faster than for any other uh, solar cell technology. And the reason is that uh, we can use the solar cells as they are produced on a roll. In silicon solar cells, you have to sort of assemble manually um, solar cells into larger panels uh, and it is extremely labor intensive and requires a long time. Here we can simply roll out uh, uh, a large roll, 100 meter long roll of solar cells in one go. So we can install 100 meters in say one minute. And this means that we can install at a rate about uh, 15 kilowatts per hour. And this is only using the low efficiency uh, materials that we have available now. And this is much more than any other solar cell technology actually. And here I can show you a movie of how um, this is done. It is also possible to employ this uh, technology in many other ways. Here we have put these uh, infinity solar cells, as we call them, inside tubes that are inflated and then put them uh, on water. And this you could use for 
of course, installations that you could cover a pond or you could perhaps even do it uh, in the ocean where you could cover an area uh, and generate electrical energy in this way. We have put the solar cells in bags on the ground and you could use this for say an expedition to a remote area uh, where you don't have access to electrical energy otherwise this would be a very lightweight, uh, lightweight uh, way of uh, carrying solar cells and then rolling them out uh, where you want to, to use them. We have even made a small helium filled balloon and put solar cells on the surface of this to show that uh, you can even generate um, energy in, in that way. And with this I would like to thank you for your attention and I have some acknowledgements uh, mainly to the uh, grant for the clean for yield and um, partial financial support from the Danish Ministry of Science and Innovation and Higher Education uh, and finally I would like to thank the Solar Group at the uh, Danish the Technical University the Department of Energy Conversion and Storage. Thank you.